Hello! In keeping with our theme of coming of age, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at what it would be like to come of age with the Batman as your father. Be it natural, adoptive, or surrogate, the idea of Robin the boy and sometimes girl wonder operating out of the Batcave in stately Wayne Manor had to be a challenge for any adolescent. So let's take a look at how this popular character has developed over the decade. A couple of limitations for the way that we're going to look at this. DC Comics has rebooted numerous times, and we'll touch on a couple of them, but I'm going to amalgamate the various DC timelines into one general one so that we can look at the different characters who have had the role of Robin. I'm only using those directly from the DC Comics, although from time to time we may mention TV, film, movies, video games, and other media. And then individual stories, one-off spoofs, imaginary stories, of course, aren't they all, will not be included so that we can stay with the more canonical look at the character. If this is the Robin that you know, you don't know Robin, and I confess a guilty pleasure, Teen Titans Go is a giggle fest that's worth the watching, but that's hardly the Robin that we're going to talk about today. In terms of the way that the comic book history happens, you'll see in the background that we move slightly from a golden age to a silver age to a bronze age. Roughly, these periods would be from about 1938 to 1954 being the golden age, 54 roughly to 1969-70, depending on who you ask, is the silver age, bronze age, up through the mid to late 80s, depending upon which company you're looking at, so that there are eras of publishing, and in those different eras, you get reboots of the different characters, or you get alterations and updates of them. But our main line, we'll take a look at the canonical or Earth-1 versions of Robin. I'll mention briefly Earth-2, and also briefly mention a couple of alternative futures of Robin-like characters. We have a much longer publishing history from Dick Grayson to the present day, Earth-2 essentially was wiped out in what was called the Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1986. And then the alternative futures haven't happened yet, but they are worth mentioning. The character of Robin first introduced as a counterpoint to the darkness of the Batman who had come out in 1938. One of the problems with Batman early on was that it was a very dark Gothic character who didn't mind using guns, wearing a Colt 45, having machine guns on the bat plane, and they felt that having a child character would give children someone to identify with. The noted author Jules Pfeiffer did not think that. In his book, The Great Comic Book Heroes, he suggested that kids hated Robin, but Batman was okay because there was still time to grow up to be Batman if you studied and trained. Nonetheless, Dick Grayson is probably who we think of when we mean Robin. In Batman 84, we have a scene that led to some of the controversy of the 50s. Bruce and Dick living together, two young men all on their own. And this led to the seduction of the innocent scandal. You would think Stately Wayne Manor, as big as it is, would have more than one bedroom in it. But this led to some of the spurious rumors and innuendo about any relationship between Batman and Robin. To solve this, in the mid-60s, the character of Aunt Harriet, Dick Grayson's long-lost aunt, was introduced, who also appeared on the TV show. But that put a woman in the house to sort of mollify uh, the parents' council type readers. For me, this is one of the most uh, important covers, most important books. In Batman 217, 
we see the Cape Crusaders striding out of the Bat Cave saying to seal it up. What really happened is that Dick Grayson went off to college and Alfred and Bruce move into a penthouse in the middle of Gotham City. But it indicates that there's a time progression taking place, that the characters can age a little bit naturally. So Robin goes from boy wonder to teen wonder and from the high school student like he was portrayed on television now to being a college student. In the mid 80s, it was determined that Robin had outgrown wearing green trunks and bare legs and developed his own character persona as Nightwing, which he still continues to this day. So the character evolves as he grows into a man, which is in keeping with our theme of coming of age. A second Robin is added, partly for merchandising purposes. There are way too many action figures and lunch boxes at stake. I have two different uh, introductions here because the Batman 357 introduces a Jason Todd character that essentially is another circus acrobat orphan almost identical to Dick Grayson. That did not last long and they recast the character into a street tough kid that Batman encounters who is trying to heist the tires off of the Batmobile. So this street tough Jason Todd is the one that we think of primarily as being Robin number two. A controversial storyline actually has Robin being killed by the Joker. Now comic book deaths happen all the time. People come back to life all the time. So that's not really uh, the point in question. The question is who killed Robin? In the book, it was the Joker. But in real life, it was the DC fans who did not like this uh, snarky, street tough Robin. And there was a 900 number where fans could call in to determine the ending of the cliffhanger, whether or not Robin was going to make it turns out to have been a very narrow thing in just a matter of a few thousand votes, but this Robin does get croaked. Just a side note, the idea of this pose of Batman cradling Robin is an homage to Michelangelo's Pieta pose, but we've seen that happening all the way back to the 1950s, the classic Robin dies at dawn, all the way through the death and the family storyline. So this is high tragedy as presented. Of course, no one stays dead. Jason Todd returns and takes on a persona as the Red Hood, and he really becomes the Robin who kills and winds up getting his own book for many years. The third Robin is introduced as a spectator who was at the circus the night when Dick Grayson's parents died and Batman took him in. And again, we wind up with a new Robin in the classic costume. The whole point of this is, Tim Drake in the bottom right says, Batman always needs a Robin. He always needs a light to balance his darkness. Because at this time with no Robin, after Jason Todd had been killed, then Batman was becoming more reckless, more dangerous, more violent, and Tim Brake was kind of taking the, the role of the child who is saying to the parent that it's time to straighten out the family. So we do have some constructed family tropes that take place in this legend. And this Robin winds up getting his own series and becomes actually a longer selling title than any series featuring any of the other iterations of Robin. And goes on and founds his own version of the Teen Titans with the teen counterparts of other heroes. Of note, in the very recently published Batman Urban Legends number six, the Tim Drake character who has been grappling with his role as Robin, with his role as, for a time, actually sneaking out on his regular father 
to hang out with Bruce Wayne and be Robin has come out as potentially being bisexual, and this storyline has yet to be fully developed. But certainly this falls into our coming-of-age umbrella as well. Robin number four, introduced in this issue of Detective Comics, is actually Tim Drake's former girlfriend, who originally was the spoiler daughter of a minor criminal whose task was to spoil the crimes of her father. So again, we have a family relationship at the center of a character's origin. For a time, they work together, but when Tim Drake goes through one of his periods of not wanting to be Robin anymore, Stephanie steps up into the role with Batman's full approval and training. However, in her effort to prove herself, she actually winds up being killed on the job. Robin number five, actually my favorite, first introduced non-canonically in a graphic novel called Son of the Demon. This is really, if Batman were in a James Bond movie, this would be on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Batman at war with uh, a great villain, and he falls in with the villain's daughter, and out of wedlock, they have a child. However, at the end of the story, the villain's daughter says she lost the baby, but the baby winds up being put up for adoption without Batman's knowledge. This story is not considered canon, but the character of Damian Wayne is brought back into the main continuity takes over the role of Robin and has conflict with all the previous Robins because he is the one true blood heir to the cape and cowl. Gets his own series and becomes pals with Superman's son, Jonathan Kent. So the true bloodline Robin, Damian Wayne, becomes the current Robin that we're working with now. However, we're not quite done, as they say on the infomercials, but wait, there's more. And for being a lone Avenger, the Batman family is pretty well extended with all the different iterations, sidekicks, and partners. For a time when there was no active Robin in the DC Universe, several teenagers in Gotham City, in a cross between an Occupy movement and the Guardian Angels, became a Robin team that addressed street crime. And one of the characters called Duke Thomas carries through and winds up becoming a character called The Signal, who is Batman's daytime operator, since Batman only comes out at night. Over on Earth 2, which is where DC had parked all of their Golden Age heroes of the 1940s, we see that that Robin actually grew up and adopted what I think is the world's best bad costume, where he tries to amalgamate elements of Robin and Batman into a new adult persona. He even meets the current counterpart, and they try out a new costume for Robin. The idea of operating in just green briefs with bare legs, where Batman has a Kevlar Nomex weave body armor suit, seems a little bit of child endangerment. So they were experimenting here in 71 with having a more adult costume for. Kerry Kelly, in the acclaimed 1986 Dark Knight Returns, is a female Robin of the future, inspired by Batman who comes on as his sidekick voluntarily and often refers to him as boss. But this is a surrogate father-daughter relationship. And then we have, spinning out of a cartoon series, a comic book called Batman Beyond, which old grumpy retired Batman takes in an assistant called Terry McGinnis, who takes one of Batman's futuristic armors 
and takes on the role, not actually being Robin, but being a Batman of the near future. For further reading, I could recommend these particular books. Will Brooker's Batman Unmasked, in which he says every generation gets the Batman it deserves. That's important. Robin, 80 Years of the Boy Wonder, a retrospective published by DC Comics, and a new book by Lauren O'Connor, Robin and the Making of American Adolescence, coming out of Rutgers. I think those are all worthy elements to add to your library. And if you'd like to continue the conversation with me, here is my contact information. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to talking with you further.